This video is part of the series in a first course in modelling analysis and control and here we're going to give an introduction to feedback in discrete time. So far then we've introduced the concept of discrete signals through sampling and a zero order hold to reconstruct a continuous time signal to enter into the system. To finish we need to consider the role of the computer given here in this loop which basically provides the decision-making or control law, here I've marked it as K in this plot diagram, which is used to influence behaviour. A core question might be, how is performance affected by using discrete signals rather than a continuous one? So you'll notice I've got my continuous law up here and my discrete implementation down here. So we're going to do some comparisons using an identical G of S. So you see I've got G in both loops. And we're also going to make the compensator identical. So these two terms here, we're going to make them identical by making them just a number, a constant K. And we're going to ask, how does the behaviour of the two loops differ? And how is this affected by the sampling rate? Here's the first example then. You can see we've given you G of S, we've given you the compensator K, and we've also told you what G of Z will be. You'll notice G of Z depends on the time or the sample time. If I find the closed loop transfer functions in continuous time, it's 1 over S plus 3, so the key thing is that the pole is minus 3, or if you were to find the discrete equivalent, it's e to the minus 3, capital T. What about the discrete closed loop transfer function. Now here you notice something interesting. The closed loop pole is not fixed. It depends upon the sample time and more in particular it doesn't map cleanly with what you get from continuous time. So the discrete time pole is different to the continuous time one and varies with sample time. Now this example demonstrates what we've just seen. You can see I've done three different sample rates and I've compared the closed loop performance with what you get with continuous time. Now what you really need to look at is these points here in these corners because these are actually the measurement points. So you're asking yourself, do these curves overlap in any sense? Well, clearly they don't. So the output and input behavior of the discrete system changes as the sample rate changes. And that's key. The behavior depends upon the sample rate is not fixed. Now there's another interesting observation here. If you look at the slowest sample rate, which is t equals 0.5, you'll see it keeps the input constant for 0.5 seconds. Constant for 0.5 seconds. Now the consequence of that for this particular example is if you look in the left-hand plot, you actually get a faster response. But this is a rather unusual um, example. Example two then, which is a second order system. So you'll see again, I've given you the closed loop transfer functions, both marked down here, and we've given you the closed loop responses. Now the most important observation here, if you look at this part of the graph, is that as T, the sampling time, gets larger, the system becomes more and more underdamped. It starts overshooting and oscillating more. So the output and input behavior of the discrete system changes with the sample rate, but more importantly, it's notably worse as the sampling time increases. So an interim summary. In general terms, the discrete control law will perform worse than the identical continuous control law, potentially far worse, and it can even be unstable if you make the sampling time too large. This is expected because of the information loss in the output sampling. The sample signal or the sample computer has to wait t seconds before it can do an update and thus if there's any useful output information occurring within that sampling instant it doesn't see it until it gets to the sample so it's slower to respond. Ideally users are going to select the sampling to be fast enough so that this intersample period is negligible compared to system dynamics so that the differences become less significant. Frequency response then. Having observed that in practice sampling and discretization seems to lead to a deterioration in performance, it's useful to ask whether frequency response methods give any further insights. Things you might remember. If you have equivalent gain plots, then a worse phase margin will tend to indicate that you've got more underdamping and or slower poles. 
phase margins are measured relative to minus 180 degrees. So if the phase is lower, that is closer to minus 180, then the phase margin is going to be smaller or worse. So in other words, anything which causes a negative phase shift tends to lead to a worse or smaller phase margin, so it's a bad thing. So we, we don't want negative phase, that's the key message. Now, the addition of the zero to hold into the closed loop, this is the key thing, gives you negative phase, and therefore the zero to hold is likely to induce worse margins and worse behaviour. Here you can see why. So I've plotted basically the bow diagrams of the zero order hold here. Now you might not be so interested in the magnitude plot. You can see that here you're fairly close to zero dBs or one at low frequencies, so you're going to be quite happy. However, you'll see the phase, this plot down here, is significantly negative. Some quite large numbers here, even minus 10 is quite a large number when it comes to phase. And so you're bringing negative phase into the system. And therefore, the introduction of the zeroed hold into the closed loop results in worse phase margins and worse performance. And this gets worse as the sampling time increases. Here's the examples then. So what you can see, I've got a simple G of S up here and a simple proportional compensator, and I've done the bow diagrams on the right. Now, what do you notice about the phase diagrams near the gain crossover frequency, which is the critical point? You can see that you're much closer to this minus 180 degree line. And therefore, your phase margin is worse, and it gets worse as T increases. Here's some numbers. With t equals 0 0.2, the phase margin for the continuous system was 90, and with the discrete system, 84. So you've lost 6 degrees of phase margin. Here's a second example. It basically gives the same point, and you can see at t equals 0 0.2, you get 44 degrees phase margin with g, and only 41 with g of z. Now that's not a huge difference, but it's enough to make the performance you can see over here more underdamped. This isn't a good design by any ways, but it's just to illustrate the impact. So another interim summary. The phase is more negative for the discrete systems due to the addition of the zero to hold. The margins are worse for the discrete systems, and the margins get worse still as the sampling time increases. So in consequence, the closed loop behaviour is worse for the discrete system if the sampling rate is too slow. Adding a zero to hold is adding phase lag, which makes the margins worse and closed loop performance worse. So we can ameliorate this only if the sampling frequency is significantly faster than the system bandwidth. And it's not always possible to make the sample rate too fast because there are other negatives. What about compensators then? We know how to design in continuous time. So it's reasonable to ask whether we can use the continuous time designs in a discrete formulation, and if so, how? We need to understand how we can map the operator S from the continuous time compensator to the Z domain, and what sort of errors this might introduce. So how might we go about this? Well, we start by looking at numerical differentiation, which is what I've shown you here. You can estimate the gradient using a straight line between two points on a curve. So you can see here, I've taken the point yk minus one, and the point yk, and I've estimated the gradient as this dotted green line here. That's my estimate. However, what you will realise is the true gradient at the point yk is this line here. So actually, you're, you're quite a long way out. All right. And what's the problem? We can only use past data in control systems. We can't see the future. This bit's not known. So we can only use past data to estimate the gradient, and therefore our estimation is lagged or slightly out of date. Now, how do we calculate the equivalent operator? So the operator S from the Laplace transforms can be considered something like a differentiator. So we can use this approximation. S is approximately 1 minus Z inverse over T. Okay, so that's basically saying that dy dt is approximately yk minus yk minus 1 over t. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to basically take my compensator m and I'm going to plug in 
this approximation here, and that gives me the discrete compensator as a function of z, and you'll notice the time, sampling time t, comes into that compensator as well. So for this example, you have a look, and you say, well, actually, if I look at the phase plots, and the gain plots of the compensator, so this bow diagram is just for m of z, actually, they're fairly similar. So in this case, the frequency response of the compensator is not much affected by the sampling time. And the differences in performance here are largely caused by the zero order hold, not by the mapping of the compensator. However, let's look at this second example. Now, what do you see? If Remember, this is the Bode diagram for the compensator. What can you see down here? Really significant phase differences. Now, this M of S is a lead. And lead compensators are chosen for this peak phase. Here in the continuous time, I'm getting 25 degrees of peak phase. But when I look at the discrete equivalence, what can you see? The peak phase I'm getting, not only is it in a slightly different position, it's significantly lower. So it's not going to be as effective. So that as T increases, the phase rotation achieved by the lead reduces markedly and thus so does the impact on margins in performance and damping. So how might we improve the mapping? We've done a simple approximation for S so far, and this is not often accurate enough. And it, therefore, it's going to produce further performance degradation in addition to what's caused by the zero order hold. So numerical analysis offers us some more precise alternatives based on integration. Now, we're only going to give one of those, the Tustin method, which is the next level of complexity, because if you want to do more and more and more, really that's not appropriate for an introductory video. So numerical integration then. What do we do? If we want to approximate the area under a curve, then in essence we do a trapezoidal approximation, which is what you can see with this shaded area here. So what we get is the new integral at sample time k, is the integral we had at the previous sample, plus t over 2, t the sample time, times basically the sum of these two values. Now you're probably fairly familiar with that formula. Now if I turn this into z transforms, what I can find is the implied integral operator is this here. Okay, so integration is equivalent to that operator there. Now if we know that integration is given here, then I can basically invert both sides and that tells me that s can be replaced by 2 over t times 1 minus z inverse over 1 plus z inverse. So wherever an s appears in your compensator, replace it with the approximation above. And we expect this to be slightly more accurate. So here's the example. And you can see I've compared continuous time, use of the Tustin approximation, and use of the simple approximation. And the most obvious difference is over here on the right-hand side in the Bode diagrams, you can see the Tustin and the continuous are pretty much overlapped, but the simple is down here. There's a much bigger phase error. So the closed loop responses are similar, but there's a much bigger error with the simple approach as opposed to using Tustin. And here we look at what happens if you increase the sampling time. So here we've gone to t equals 0.4, and here we've gone to t equals 1. So at 0 0.4, again, looking at the phase diagrams, you can see with Tustin, there's minimal error. It's still working quite well, whereas with the simple method, the errors got quite large. Now, as you go to t equals 1, which is perhaps getting a bit extreme, you'll see some errors begin to creep in between the Tustin and the continuous, and the simple down here is simply not good enough. Some conclusions then. The phase of a discrete system is more negative due to the addition of the zero order hold, and thus your margins are going to get worse. And if the margins get smaller as the sampling time increases, the closed loop behaviour is also going to be worse. In addition, you've got to discretize the compensator, and this may make the scenario even worse if the desired phase and gain characteristics are significantly distorted by the mapping that you use. Here we've illustrated a simple method and a Tustin mapping, and basically we've indicated that Tustin preserves the compensator frequency response pretty well over a good range of frequencies, as long as T obviously is not too 
large. Now, we also, a key point here is the margins in the discrete case are worse. Irrespective of what we do, they're worse. So a pragmatic solution, if you're beginning from the continuous time compensator, is simply to reduce the gain by a small amount in order to recover the desired margins.